Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming early uh, to this meeting. Um, I'm Caroline Harper. I'm the head of the social development program here at the Overseas Development Institute. Um, and we're very pleased to be hosting this event today. Um, along with our partner, uh, UNGAI, the United Nations Girls <coughs> Education Initiative. Um, so for the last two years, ODI's social development program has been working with UNGAI on a research collaboration, identifying good practice and building evidence around girls' education and gender equality in education. Um, and today we'll unpack some of this research as well as discuss more broadly what works well in achieving targeted changes to girls' education and how this can contribute to their empowerment. And also what evidence is needed to understand and improve the gender dynamics of education. So as many of you will be aware, tomorrow is the International Day of the Girl Child. Um, the 2011 United Nations General Assembly de declared the 11th of October as the International Day of the Girl Child. Um, and this year the theme is girls' progress equals goal Girls' progress equals goals' progress, a global call for data. Um, so this theme does highlight priority gender issues in the sustainable development goals, and also the large gaps in data, in data about girls in general. So I'm going to um, introduce our panelists. We're really delighted today to have some a, a gathering of people who could be said to be some of the world's experts on education and girls. So it's a fantastic panel, and we very much appreciate them all coming. Um, speaking first, we have Nora Files, who's the head of the Secretariat for UNGAI, and has flown into London today to join us for this event. Thank you very much. Um, we'll then hear from Gertrude Kabwazi, um, who is uh, online here, um, and um, we'll hear from Advancing Girls Education in Africa, which is known as Age Africa. Uh, Gertrude is in Malawi, and we hope that the video link will, will take us through the entire morning without any failure. Um, if it does drop out, please bear with us. Uh, next, we'll hear from Amy Parker, who is an education advisor with Plan International at the end here. And our fourth speaker is Dr. Elaine Un Unterhalter, who's Professor of Education and International Development at the Institute of Education at the University of London. So once we've heard from our four speakers, we'll hear from Dr. Rachel Hinton at the end of the, the table here as a discussant. Rachel's currently works for the Department for International Development as a Senior Social Development Advisor, and she leads the department's education research program. Um, so I think you'll agree with me, it's an excellent panel that we've um, the pleasure to host this morning. Um, so our panelists will give a short presentation. We'll then have comments and questions from our discussant, and then you'll have the chance to answer questions. Um, for those in the audience who are on Twitter, please do tweet as the event progresses. You can use the hashtag uh, Day of the Girl and our handle at ODI Dev to follow the conversation. Um, I also should welcome everyone who's online. I think we have a large number of people, um, over a hundred, um, registered to, to watch online. So welcome. You can also send in your questions, as I think you know when you sign up online, um, and they should come up on my <coughs> iPad. Um, so we can get going with our panel discussion. Please switch <coughs> off your phones or set them to silent if you haven't already done so. Um, so we'll start this morning with Nora. Um, Nora's head of the Secretariat for UNGAI. Um, and UNGAI is a multi-stakeholder partnership committed to improving the quality and availability of girls' <coughs> education. Um, Nora joined <coughs> the UNGAI Secretariat um, in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and before that, she headed the education policy team for uh, CEDA, in the Canadian CEDA and served as a senior education specialist for CEDA's Asia program uh, from 2003. So a very long track record in education. Um, today she's going to give a brief overview of the ODI and UNGAI research collaboration, and she'll talk about the transformative potential of education for girls and for society, and also talk to the efforts of different actors, including UNGAI, in generating and sharing evidence about what works for girls' education. 
Um, I ask all the speakers to speak into the microphones because that means our online speakers can hear you. Um, so please make sure you do that. And I'll hand over to Nora. Great. Thanks for, is this on now? Yep. Yes, it's on. Thank you. It's a delight to be with you here today. It's um, exactly three years today when we launched the Good Practice Fund. And then after a year, we established a relationship with ODI. Now, as, uh, as we said, Ungai is a partnership. We are not a program delivery mechanism, but rather a partnership. And we work with civil society actors, multilateral, bilateral, and academics. And it's because we are, can depend on this partnership that we can move our agenda for girls' education and gender equality, move it forward. So the Good Practice Fund, as we've come to call it, the Ungai Fund for the Documentation of Good Practice, was launched with the goal of strengthening the evidence base on promising approaches to girls' education and gender equality, with a particular attention to the under-reported under actors. And we did so by providing an opportunity for pr practitioners to define and document their work with, uh, by providing a very small micro-grant and some technical support. We had an open call for proposals, although quite a serious uh, set of criteria to qualify. We received over 350 applications and we selected 17. These included national NGOs, international NGOs working with a local partner, two district-level government departments and one national teacher union working with the Canadian Teacher Federation. We, in, we encouraged a critical approach for partners to ask difficult questions of their own experience. How do we know? What do we mean by words like empowerment, sustainable, systems change? What have we learned? And for others to replicate this model what would they need to know? We also encouraged a focus on the links between girls' education and deep structures of gender inequality. While partners often identified specific groups uh, to the, as the focus of their work, such as tribal girls in India, slum workers in Nairobi, urban girls in Lagos, disabled children in Bangladesh, pregnant girls and young mothers in rural Guinea, the focus on deep structures of disparity remained a constant and important theme. And the group spoke about their ability to push against these deep structures, even if they were not able to actually shift them a bit. The key findings of the case studies are on the website, so I won't take you there. But I just wanted to share a very few points on our experience of what, what Ungai learned. We discovered, first of all, to, that to actually benefit from the experience of local practitioners, we needed to build the skills <clears throat> of research, of analysis, and of case study writing. Thus, we needed to adopt a process of capacity building, although that was not originally in the work, in the design at all. The role of ODI with the Ungai Secretariat was critical to helping partners draw out the rich findings and conclusions that could be recognized and understood by global readers. We learned that experience and evidence are not the same thing, but that each contribute to our understanding of what works. And we found that experience can help us understand why efforts do not work, or perhaps not at the speed we anticipate. This raised new questions about the nature of evidence. We debated in house of well, good practice, good enough practice, best practice. It was a very interesting existential discussion which we had on a regular basis. It also highlighted the challenge of demonstrating effectiveness, especially cost effectiveness, and the limitations of language to describe the nuance of gender change. In addition to the good practice case studies, ODI and Ungai are working on a series of research projects, including two evidence reviews. <coughs> the first evidence review, Girls Learning and Empowerment, the Role of School Environments, will be launched tomorrow on the Ungai and the ODI website. There are a series of others which are coming out over the next number of months, too. 
Now, I have also been asked to just reflect briefly on the effort of other actors on, in generating and sharing what works for girls' education. And now a lot of, a lot of will be in the room, will be working on this, so this is, you know, I'm just going to offer a few thoughts. Um, I'm in Europe this week, firstly, to launch the gender review of the Global Monitoring Report, now called the GEM Report. And this is one way of building evidence that I would recommend you have a look at. The GEM report is intended to document the, and monitor the progress towards the achievement of global goals. But for the first time now, and this is a joint report with Ungai, they are actually looking at how well education influences the broader gender equality in society, looking at particularly participation, labor market, violence, and other factors of of gender equality. This is a way of collecting evidence and uh, doing analysis which is new for the GEM report and we are really excited to be part of that. I wanted to talk very briefly about two other initiatives, um, actually three. One, I think the, we are really keen followers of the work of Pauline Rose and the center, the real center. She is bringing to light some data around girls' education areas, which is really un undocumented. So we know now more about girls in situations, crisis and conf conflict, about equity issues where uh, the poorest girls in Pakistan and India, and the, the, the issue of equity and poverty in education, how that intersects with gender, is an important area of work that she leads on. The work on real lives, real choices, plans 10-year longitudinal study, which you may, you may speak about. Great. That's, uh, I'll just give you a quick un unpaid editorial message here. Um, this paper is being launched tomorrow, and we're really excited about this way of collecting evidence, which provides us with the granular data behind numbers and helps us understand what girls are doing when they're not in school, why they drop out, the reality of of labor in their own lives, of violence. Um, two other quick things. One is the, the uh, an evidence review, a series of evidence reviews are being, are being done, but one which we have been particularly interested in waiting for is one done by the, to be released tomorrow again, it's the rigorous review on global research um, on policy and practice on school-related gender-based violence done by the Institute of Education with UNICEF based on a four-country study um, as a context, but the evidence review, of course, is all of the, all the evaluated documentation on that area. It's a, a very important paper and uh, something for you to look to. And lastly, of course, our most, um, much of our attention, for Ungai at least, is to learn from the Girls Education Challenge Fund and the focus of, on research, which a DFID has been able to to, to put for, for the global community to learn from experience. And that is an enormously important piece of work which we, we are really um, pleased to, to host on our website as often as we can. That is the one thing which um, this initiative is not as good at is actually sharing. And we're waiting for more and more d documentation to come out of that. And Rachel can, can correct me if I'm wrong now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nora, for that. That's a a good, great overview of the amount of work going on um, and also um, some of the, the real issues that I think we're all engaging with now about these deep structures of gender inequality so we can, that can become part of our, our discussion. Um, so now we're going to move to Gertrude. Um, uh, Gertrude Kabazi joins us uh, from Malawi. She's a uh, passionate supporter of girls' education and women's opportunities and country director for Age Africa, an organization which provides opportunities to young women in Malawi through initiatives in education, mentoring, and leadership development. Um, Age Africa is also an Ungai Good Practice Fund grantee. It conducted an assessment of its uh, CHATS after school program, which is active at 21 secondary schools in southern Malawi. So Gertrude will be talking to us today about that program and in particular the impact of this program on girls' aspirations and future opportunities. Um, and she'll also discuss the value that Age Africa gained from the Ungai Good Practice Fund process. So I'm going to hand over now to Gertrude. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by thanking everyone for this opportunity. 
on behalf of Age Africa and the girls in Malawi, I know who are invisible participants to this discussion. I would like to thank you for this opportunity. I would like to start by sharing with you uh, our Malawi context. Uh, Malawi currently is uh, the poorest country in, in, in the world and uh, also has been challenged by a drought, which uh, we experienced last year and now the effects we are experiencing them now because there's uh, food shortage in the country, which uh, also is uh, affecting our programming as an organization and other uh, players uh, in, in, in Malawi. We work with uh, girls in the rural communities and girls supplement labor in their households uh, where their mothers are food managers and food providers. So that in its sense, it's also affecting the girls highly. And we work in the southern part of Malawi where it has also been affected highly by the food shortage. So we are in a context that we are dealing with a lot of challenges as we are, are, are doing our programming in terms of like promoting girls' education. A little bit about uh, Age Africa, as already highlighted, Age Africa is one of the organizations in Malawi that is uh, supporting government, complementing government's efforts and also other players in promoting girls' education. We are doing this through three components. One is we are providing scholarships to girls who are needy. Studies have shown that most girls are dropping out of school due to lack of school fees and school supplies. And again, they walk long distances to school. As an organization, we respond to that by providing school fees, school supplies. For those girls who have, ha who have to deal with uh, long distances, we provide them with bicycles to cycle to school. But apart from that, we also have a life skills program and a livelihood skills program. Under the life skills program, we want to uh, promote the girls' agency because we have learned over a period of time that providing school fees only addresses the hardware part of the needs. And we yet we need to also uh, deal with the software part of the girls' needs. So the life skills is uh, providing that kind of support in terms of like uh, uh, addressing the girls', girls issues holistically. We are in 24 schools now and uh, in five districts, and we were targeting more than 1,200 girls in our programming. And uh, we have uh, the, the program which is called CHATS. CHATS is short for Creating Health Approaches to Success. Essentially, it just literally means chatting. We are providing space, exclusive space for the girls to chat, but chat on issues that affect their day-to-day -day life and that, that affect their opportunities, access to opportunities that can help transform their lives. Under charts, we have other components, which I will talk about later. But before I do that, I just wanted also to share with you the third component that we have, which is a pause. Pause is for secondary education uh, program, which is looking at how can we help the girls transition from secondary education, education and to other opportunities that exist out there in the world, which includes tertiary education. Under that, we have a uh, few scholarships. We are supporting girls in Malawi, in our universities, in our public universities, who are failing to access loans uh, under the government loan scheme. In terms of uh, the impact that we have registered over a period that we have been operational in the country, uh, we have um, uh, evidence that 92% of the church participants are completing their school versus the 50 percent average, average of the 50 percent that are completing school in Malawi. So that's a huge uh, uh, impact when it comes to keeping the girls in school, but also making sure that they complete their edu secondary education. But we also have registered 94 percent of church participants that are delaying pregnancy and early marriage. And this, this is also in comparison to the national statistics of uh, more than 50 percent of the girls who are dropping out of school due to pregnancies or entering marriage at an early age. So Age Africa is having a great impact in making sure that these people are delaying pregnancy as well as they're also delaying uh, going to get married at an at tender age. But we also have high indicators in knowledge in human rights, including gender rights. But also we have registered, we have noticed and observed, and also there's evidence of girls uh, building up self-esteem, the charts building girls' self-esteem, but also leadership skills, as well as future planning skills uh, among the chat, chat participants. This has been uh, registered over a period of time that we've implemented charts. 
through our, our own uh, M&E system, but also, as I uh, already mentioned, we were privileged, we were one of the few that were privileged to be funded by the Angai uh, uh, Good Practice Fund, where we underwent an evaluation, and that evaluation supported us in a lot of ways. One of the ways that uh, it allowed us to invest in creating a rigorous uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, system, which is uh, helping us to learn more from our programming to also measure the impact of uh, uh, our programming elements, especially the charts. But apart from that, we also have two people now in the office that are uh, dedicated to making sure that there's da proper data collection, but also proper analysis of the data that is being collected to make sure that it's really indeed speaking to us about our programming, our programming impact. But also the um, Angai uh, Good Practice Fund helped us to learn uh, that we need to increasingly focus on gender and power issues. It's not enough to provide information to the girls on the skills that they need, but it's, uh, we need to really, really go down to deal with the underlying issues uh, of how, it, uh, it, how, it, how, how they are featured, how they are position, positioned in community and in the in society. And no matter, how, sometimes they can be empowered themselves, they can have um, uh, the agency, but they operate in a context which does not provide, is not ready to provide that kind of space for them to exercise their empowerment. So we need to deal with the gender and power issues. Uh, yes, as we promote girls' agency, but also as we also deal with uh, issues in the communities that affect or impede on the, uh, the, the girls to exercise their uh, their, 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 uh, their empowerment. Um, but apart from that, it also helped us to look at how can we um, help to engage other players, other people who are instrumental in ensuring that uh, girls' uh, empowerment, girls' education is effective. Uh, now, right now, we have included a component in our programming uh, which inv is involving males, boys in the schools. We now have introduced uh, boys' clubs in the schools to make sure that we are also promoting positive masculinity among the boys, which has been noted uh, that uh, if we just leave the boys outside uh, uh, programming, it, it kind of uh, affects our programming in a lot of ways because the boys remain uh, not knowledgeable of what, what it means to, 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 to be looking at the girls in a, in, a, in a positive way and also supporting the girls, but also just understanding how negative masculinity affects them as boys. Uh, they are also, uh, it can negatively affect them and they also need to understand that it's not just about uh, supporting girls, but also how it affects them as, as beings in a society. But we also are developing a third component from the Angai Good Practice Fund. It also helped us see how can we enhance aspirations for the girls? How can we make sense so that the girls should remain in school? Because we constantly had questions about why, why do you want me to remain in school? Like even the parents, when we talked to them, they asked us many questions. Why would you want me to send the girls to school? Because after school, there's no employment. They go back to their village and there are even few spaces in colleges to absorb the girls the number of girls graduating, the number of students graduating. Now we said, how can we make sure that we are increasing these aspirations? So we decided to develop an, um, an entrepreneurship education program, which is going to provide an alternative to employment. And again, to help redefine education, not limiting it just to employment, but that the, the, the young people must understand that there are also other alternatives that they can do to create uh, you know, the sustainable livelihoods for themselves, but also contribute to changing their own environments in their own different spaces. Under the Entrepreneurship Education Pro, uh, Program, we have specific, one of the main uh, areas we are focusing on is uh, promoting agriculture entrepreneurship. Uh, we have done that because we understand that Malawi, we know that Malawi is an agro-based economy. 80% of uh, Malawi's uh, GDP is, is, is uh, highly dependent on agriculture in the country. So, but we are trying to agriculture entrepreneurship in a way that it's uh, more exciting for the young people because we had uh, studies have shown that young people are not interested to engage in agriculture. They say they find it boring, sometimes they find it uh, labor intensive. They want something that is cool for them. So we said, how can we make sure that we are uh, contributing to the country's economy, making agriculture more exciting, but also making it uh, more of an entrepreneurship issue other than just 
uh, subsistence uh, agriculture. So we have, in the process of like developing that program, we have already started, we have already started consulting uh, different uh, people who are very well conversant with in those areas. Uh, and we would like also to make sure that these two, the subsistence uh, agriculture and uh, commercial agriculture, they are, they, they, they are, they are well, well linked together. Because studies have shown that women are mostly involved in subsistence agriculture and the men are the ones who are involved in uh, uh, commercial agriculture. So through this initiative, we would like to make it more exciting so that, so that all social groups must participate in both subs subsistence agriculture but also in uh, uh, commercial agriculture. Uh, but apart from that, we also feel like uh, this is going to be very helpful because it's also going to help uh, the young people aspire for their future. Because once they know that when they exit school, when they graduate from high school, they have something that they can look up to, they can look for, like, like they can expect to do uh, in, in the communities, that can be of, of greater help and can also aspire, inspire other young people who are in the lower grades uh, in terms of like primary schools and other education structures. So we, that, that's just about what we are doing as Age Africa. But largely, we have been uh, a learning organization all the period that we've been operational. We are a learning organization. We try as much as possible to plow back, back our learning uh, processes, our learning less, I mean, the lessons that we generate from uh, uh, programming. But also, we uh, want to make sure that uh, data collection and measuring the impact is not just done by Age Africa, but all stakeholders must also engage in uh, uh, following or monitoring or evaluating the changes that uh, we are expecting from the girls. The communities themselves must also uh, participate in monitoring the change. The girls themselves, they also must participate in monitoring the change. So right now, we are also in the process of strengthening our community engagement uh, component to make sure that the community at all levels are moving along with us. Thank you very much. That's what I heard from like Age Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Gertrude. That was a very comprehensive, um, wide-ranging uh, introduction to your work. Um, and we can come back to some of that uh, later with some of the questions. Um, so I want to move now to Amy Parker, who's Education Advisor for Plan International. Um, Plan uh, International, as you know, is a children's charity which uh, advances children's rights and equality for girls all over the world. Um, Amy actually was a secondary school teacher um, for five years and started her international development career as a volunteer teacher training in Rwanda. Um, uh, today she will give an overview of Plan's work on girls' education and gender equality in education and Plan's experience and aspirations to use an integrated approach. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, as um, you just said, uh, PLAN is a global children's charity working across 51 countries worldwide, um, and education is one of our key themes. Um, we firmly believe in the right to education for all children, and we recognise that girls, and especially adolescent girls, are often the first to lose this right. We therefore design and implement our education programmes through a gender lens, allowing us to identify and address key barriers to girls accessing and succeeding in education. Early this year, we actually um, took some time to relook at how we define quality education. Um, and the diagram shows a little bit um, how we conceptualise this. Um, the circles surrounding the education as a toolkit for life signify the competencies that we believe equate to a quality education. Um, and historically, PLAN really does focus on the sort of emotional intelligence competencies and the high level competencies. And we work particularly through things like girls' clubs um, to raise um, life skills, confidence, communication, leadership skills. But we do have a similar approach to raising academic competences. An example would be um, study groups in Sierra Leone and through um, peer learning group for girls um, in Cambodia. We're also looking to increase our vocational um, skills education. And we specifically try to focus on addressing stereotypes for girls and young women. Um, entering the workforce and encouraging support for girls to enter non-traditional female roles. Surrounding the um, circles are the conditions that we believe need to be in place to um, enable quality education for girls. 
with hardware, plan supports construction of schools, but ensuring that they're gender sensitive and girl friendly. So things like segregated um, wash facilities and menstrual hygiene management support. With software, we're looking at the teachers and teaching skills there, and we focus very much on gender responsive pedagogy, but also around things like classroom management and corporal punishment. Um, we recently led a qualitative research um, piece in Mali around corporal punishment, and it's something that we've been working on for many years in the country, but we're still struggling to gain any sort of traction in it. And digging down really sort of showed um, just how complex the nature is around the fact that boys are generally still getting beaten harder, but girls are getting punished more frequently because they're turning up late at school still and that they're not learning their lessons, so to speak. But then, as sort of the, the panel, panellists before me have sort of spoken, it's around trying to dig into those deeper complexities. Um, we, and it does also lead on to nice of the work that we do around social and cultural norms and beliefs. Um, this is an area that we work closely with communities and local leaders to analyse and address barriers to girls' education and to promote positive um, behaviour around allowing girls to access and attend regularly and complete their education. Looking at governance, um, we work very strongly with schools and communities to, pro to promote participatory and inclusive effective school governance. Um, we look to um, actively seek out girls to um, work on student councils um, and to use things like um, scorecarding to really hold um, duty bearers to account um, with the provision of quality education. We do bring this up to a national level and international level um, with regards to youth advocacy. Um, one example actually would be in Malawi where our Malawian youth advocates have succeeded in getting the marriage bill passed that raises the age, to, um, the age of marriage to 18 and they're currently working on a constitutional thing to make sure that that uh, <coughs> marries up to the uh, bill that's just been passed. Okay. We've also just developed um, a theory of change. This is its first public outing, so um, I'd be quite pleased to get some feedback on it. <laughs> um, we are looking um, to see girls progressing through education and reaching their potential emotionally, socially and intellectually, so that they're able to make informed choices about their life and to achieve their best possible um, life chances. And as with the um, conceptual model beforehand, it very much um, signifies a holistic approach to girls' education. Um, with the girl firmly at the centre um, and then with all the different levels influencing and mutually reinforcing her educational outcomes. I'm just going to use one example as to how we, we see this working. Um, school safety has been um, an area of importance for PLAN for many years and we've been, working to bring, um, we've been working to bring attention to and to eliminate corporal punishment, sexual violence and bullying in and around schools. And we always apply a gender lens to this, recognising that girls are vulnerable to abuse by the very people who are supposed to be protecting them. And so we work with girls, boys, schools and communities to combat these issues through things like teacher training, um, through introducing codes of conduct um, and positive, positive masculinity work with boys. And then also um, having wide ranging campaigns at local, national and international level with the aim of ensuring that the school environment is friendly and um, protective and then enables girls to achieve. Um, and then the arrows really show how we look to analyse all of these levels of programme design and then continue to review the different influences throughout implementation using effective monitoring evaluation and learning. So finally, what have we learnt? Um, You've probably noticed I'm a bit of a pictorial person, so you've just had lots of different diagrams. Um, we had a long-running um, DFID-funded um, programme called Building Skills for Life, um, which focused on increasing the number of adolescent girls enrolling in and completing quality primary and lower secondary education in seven countries. And this diagram um, illustrates uh, findings, final findings, um, and I think it does illustrate quite nicely... Um, a little bit where we're at with girls' education and sort of where we need to be looking to reinforce it. Um, we do know that a holistic approach is absolutely necessary. Um, we need to be working with different aspects that influence the girls' educational experience. Um, in this programme, for example, we work to influence positive change in education, gender, sexual reproductive health rights, rights and protection. What we also know is that we need to get better at carrying out detailed power analyses right at the beginning of, of any programme design. Girls' education touches on complex power relationships 
um, threatening the status, quo, the status quo, including girls' position in society, family roles and responsibilities, and the value placed on different um, roles. We also know that, um, that the progression of change, as everybody in this room I'm sure knows, um, um, is different and slow. Knowledge is easier to build, attitude a little bit slower, and behaviour change takes a long, a long time to change. Um, small steps forward, the odd one or two backwards, and we're often looking at generational change. Whilst we offer, and as, as an example, we often hear um, parents advocating for their girls' education and stating just how important it is. But then when we do ask boys if, if they would do domestic work when they become fa fathers, it's often frequently met with laughter. We know that domestic work is undervalued and that, a major, and that it is a major barrier to girls remaining in school. And without this shift happening, girls' education will continue to face challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, so we move on to our final speaker, um, Elaine Unterhalter. Um, Elaine <coughs> is uh, from the Institute of Education um, and works on themes concerned with gender, race and class inequalities and their bearing on education. Um, her special interests are in the capability approach and human development and education in Africa, particularly in South Africa. And her current concerns with education, poverty and global social justice. So Elaine, I'm going to hand over to you now. Okay, thanks Caroline. And uh, again, it's uh, really nice to add my voice to those of the others of a, a lovely opportunity to discuss issues which are very close to my... Um, interests and engagement. I think the question I was asked to address concerned what, um, what were some of the major changes that needed to happen in uh, relation to uh, girls' education and transformational social practices. And I want to divide this into two levels. The first is, and I think we've heard some really good examples of this from PLAN and, and from Malawi, about listening to girls' voices, listening to them in all the nuance and complexity and possibly often when they are silenced, that, that power, those processes of power that Amy was talking about at the moment often um, make it difficult for girls to express what it is they aspire to and so that careful sort of listening is incredibly important. Um, I think we often assume that the words girls, gender and equality are things that everybody agrees on their meaning and in fact you know they're hundreds of thousands, probably thousands of languages in Africa. And if you were to translate gender or girl in every, in every language, it would be different because that it's so socially located. So that brings me to the other major point um, that I wanted to stress, which is this process of social transformation. Now, um, I've had a quick look at Amy's diagram and I can see many interesting layers from it. In the Ungai process, there's many, there's the sense of how do you address structural inequalities. The, but I think what's surprising to all of us, and you know, we've worked on these issues, many of us, for decades, is how hardwired into societies um, all societies, is misogyny, violence against women, how the very institutions that are oriented to providing health or education are often reproducing those deep, deep-seated gender inequalities. And so while it's very important to start at the level of girls and communities and listen to them and keep their voice and representation constantly in play, it's also terribly important to undertake that deep work of looking at how institutions reproduce gender inequality and connecting up all those agencies. Um, the study that Nora mentioned of school-related gender-based violence, which I and a number of my colleagues at the Institute of Education worked on the rigorous review of literature to generate, pointed out how disconnected so many initiatives are. And this good, the Ungai's Good Practice Fund is warmly to be welcomed. It's a wonderful um, beginning, um, as is this attention to norms and um, 
uh, changing attitudes because when I uh, led the uh, team that looked at the rigorous literature review for DFID about four years ago, we found that there was very little research on changing norms and uh, attitudes. It was one of the gaps. There'd been a huge literature on cash transfers, on building schools, and this area was under research. So this is warmly to be welcomed. But what we know too little about is how all these other layers connect. Um, so there's a very idealistic spin to Amy's diagram, but actually what is disarticulating things is very much needs to be investigated. Teacher training in just about every country in the world, including this one, does hardly anything on gender equality. Um, there's a lot on learning outcomes, there's a lot on classroom management, there's a lot on curriculum content. But if gender equality and challenging uh, violence against women and addressing, um, listening to the silenced voices of the, the poorest and the most marginalized, that needs a massive change in, in orientation. Government officials or leaders of NGOs, part of this is anecdotal, but part of it comes from a number of uh, studies I've, I've done, are often extremely hostile to the girls that their programs are engaged to fear. And they're reflecting the hostility that exists in the society. You can't expect people who are often themselves highly uh, measured about how many people pass, where people go, to, to change their attitudes. We need lots more m investment in uh, looking at government officials, at looking at teachers, at their professional training and support, and, and making gender equality something that is sustained and um, joined up. And that's where I think the research and next layer, next generation of investment needs to go. Great. Thank you very much, Elaine. Um, a lot of common themes coming out, I think, um, in all of the uh, presentations today. Um, and so now I'll hand over to Rachel. Uh, we're running a little bit late, so I don't know how many, uh, how much time you think you'll need. I'll keep it shorter. Okay. Um, because I want to have time for uh, discussions and, and questions. Um, uh, Rachel is a social anthropologist, I think probably very well known to many of you here in the audience. Uh, she has a particular expertise in the field of refugees and education. Um, and at DFID, she's responsible for commissioning research that will inform education programming in developing countries. So Rachel's acting as our discussant, and we'll um, start to ask the panel some, some questions. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a genuine pleasure to be here and to um, hear firsthand th some of these new case study material. Um, I was at UNGA, the UN General Assembly, a couple of weeks ago, and I think one of the things that's testimony to all of this work in case studies coming up, you know, when you think of that big room of, uh, you know, state, state heads of state and the array of translators above and, um, you know, the, the power in that place, actually how much attention there was to gender was really quite inspiring. And I would never have thought in 2005 when we were looking at the first MDG that that would be the case. And I think um, you know, everyone plays their part. And indeed, the, the Learning Generation report that was launched there that many of you um, will have read also pays real attention to the issues of girls' education. Um, and again, um, thanks to a lot of the work and research that many people here have done, including the literature review that brought together a lot of this work that Elaine and Nora were both very um, involved with. Um, I think um, one of the things, if I just put the spotlight for a moment on DFID, one of the things that DFID's tried to do is take on board some of these bigger challenges that some of these structural issues and the issues of the enabling environment to make sure we make a difference for girls. Um, and the UK has actually um, had the UK AIDS strategy, but also the Gender Equality Act in 2014 that did what um, Amy talked about, put a gender lens on things. And I think this point of having a gender lens is absolutely key. Um, and we've talked a little bit about um, the Girls Education Challenge Fund as well. And I think that has been really important to looking at what Nora talked about, which I love that phrase, the deep structures of disparity. And I think... Um, that's something that we need to continue to do 
in the research. Um, I'm responsible for research in, um, in DFID on education, and we've really got some big new programs there, which are hugely exciting, including um, ESRC research, but a big program on RISE, which is looking at research into improving the systems of education. It's looking at some of these interconnections that Elaine was talking about, not just about the different stakeholders, but how they interconnect between each other um, to either enable or, or disable change for all children in the system to um, deliver education for them. Um, so I think, just in the interest of, interest of time, um, I'll, I'll skip on to just, just thinking about a few of those um, issues that have come up in those presentations. And I see six things that we've heard this morning um, really come to light. Um, the first was the financial barriers question, and I think um, Gertrude in Malawi there talking about scholarships is a nice example of addressing that. I think the communications and addressing attitudes has been huge as the second issue. The chat program is obviously one that brings up a chance for, for girls themselves to talk about those barriers. Um, the girls' clubs that Plan talked about. I think then the third on structural inequalities um, that we heard about and that link into things like early marriage that Gertrude was, was speaking of there. The GEC programme has a fantastic Theatre for Change initiative that also links into this issue trying to address this. Um, and the institutions also addressing those, um, reproducing those deep-seated inequalities. Engaging boys and men is something that I think um, DFID could, would acknowledge we haven't probably done enough of, and I think that's something that um, bringing in all of those with power into the equation has to be something that we do. And I think Afghanistan programs, the Stages program, um, actually is trying to do this, and it also responds to Elaine's um, question or challenge to all of us about are we helping teachers at the initial stages of their training when people are first interested in going into um, being the leaders for children um, and their future, future lives, um, how, what are we teaching them about gender inequalities? Are we putting that onto the agenda? And I think that's a really interesting um, programme in Afghanistan there, trying to do some of that. The, the fifth thing is about raising aspirations, and there's some extremely exciting new research coming up, actually, um, some of it in behavioural economics as well, and it's interesting bringing in a whole group of academics who really haven't engaged in the past much with education research, and I think it's quite an exciting time for education when we've not only got researchers from anthropology and from social psychology, but we've now got a broader group of researchers coming in from governance, from political science, and from um, economics, and I think we should welcome this opening up of um, the space for us to take so many different lenses to the challenges of getting all children learning. Um, and then the last thing I think is the accountability question. Um, I think plans work there that were mentioned very briefly about scorecards and bringing in communities into looking at accountability is huge. Um, DFID invest um, an awful lot of money in education program. We've supported 11 million girls over our last five years in our bilateral programs, um, but we know that a lot of resources don't get to where they're needed, and we know that often it's the girls who are those who suffer most when resources um, leak out of the system in a multitude of ways. So with that, I think it'd be nice to just um, dig a bit deeper and ask a few challenging questions to, um, to our panellists here. Um, I, I also would say that I think that it's great having the case studies um, and getting that depth. And as an anthropologist, of course, living and understanding your community has, is, is the starting point of any piece of work. But I also would say that we haven't done enough at scale with, you know, of, of initiatives that really can be scaled. Part of that is the affordability issue that several panellists brought up. But it's not just that. It's, again, about the institutions, the power, the politics. Um, and I also think we haven't done enough over the long term. So Young Lives, for example, is a fantastic longitudinal programme of research that helps us track girls over time um, and look at those difficult points um, where they may drop out. Gertrude talked about the transition into secondary. But there are many different um, life points that mean girls may, may not continue in um, to 
achieve the, the kind of qualifications or the life skills they need for the future. So four things that seem to me to be jumping out here that we perhaps have still got big challenges in, and I'd really welcome hearing what the panellists think. The first is about the synthesis of all this. So yes, we've got you know, the literature reviews, Diff has paid for a lot of this. We've got case studies, um, we've got best practice. But for the policymakers who are sitting in a country in Sierra Leone or in Mozambique or in Nepal, do they have access to that? And do they have it in an accessible form that is meaningful to them at the right moment in the policy decision making process? And do they know how to access the financial resource that would go behind um, a national plan? And what more can we do to, to make that accessible? My second question is about the research tools. Um, we've heard that there's lots of different initiatives here that are really making a difference to children. But do we have the diagnostics for that Nepalese policymaker to decide which of all of these fantastic initiatives they should take on board, they should fund, and they should take to scale? The third thing is about the political economy. Um, clearly, to make the success that you have in these, in these studies that have come out, there have been successes in shifting an enabling environment to make this possible. So what, what did you do? What were the... Um, if you like, the factors for success that made that possible. And my fourth question is about systems level change. Um, where have you seen a transformation um, for resourcing at scale by national governments? And if you haven't seen that, um, what, what insights has that told you? Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Some very good questions there. Um, and we're actually back to time, which is very good. Um, so some really interesting and um, thought-provoking comments from everyone there. I'm particularly struck by some of the statements that I've heard. Um, I mean, Nora talking about these <coughs> deep structures that girls push against them, even if they're not able to shift them, um, which is a very sort of compelling way of thinking how girls live out their everyday lives. and. Um, Obviously not unique to, I mean, everybody has experienced that, um, but the, um, the, the depth of these structures that they're trying to push against um, is, is really um, quite overwhelming, I think, sometimes. Um, I think Gertrude reminding us that poverty um, at the very beginning of um, her introduction is so fundamental, just providing the resources to get to school and poverty and inequality in the way that uh, links up with uh, discriminatory norms, I think, is something that um, <coughs> we are, are all reflecting on, but we mustn't forget that poverty is still very, very important. Um, and then, um, Amy, coming back to power analysis again, um, which I think was a common theme for everyone, um, how, we, um, how we deal with issues of uh, inequalities of power. Um, and um, Elaine, again, reflecting that about the different interpretations of gender inequality and what that actually means, which um, is really very, very important, and uh, what is hardwired into society as a whole. So listening to all of this, I think this is a very different discussion about girls' education than one could have heard five, certainly 10 years ago, and maybe even five years ago. Um, so the discussions about girls' education, I think, are in a quite different place now. Um, I'm going to open this up for, for questions, and uh, I hope we'll be able to take a couple of rounds. Um, so before the, the panel addresses uh, Rachel's questions, uh, we'll combine them together with some of yours. So please do raise your hand. Um, please state your name and um, where you're from, and please keep your question succinct so we can fit in a number. There's a question here. <coughs> <coughs> 